Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about the uh, philosophy of Protagoras, whom I'm reading out of a pre-Socratics reader. So Protagoras was one of the Sophists, which is actually a group that I'm really, really fascinated by, and I have been for most of the time that I've taught rhetoric and composition, uh, which is about 15 years now? No. Maybe. I don't know. Oh. It's 2000. Uh, I started in 2009. So yeah, about 15 years. Wow. Oh, uh, fuck. <laughs> anyway, so uh, the Sophists were a really interesting group. They were, they were a loose sort of confederation of people, more than an actual school necessarily, but they kind of ran schools. I, I often say that the sophists basically invented my job when I'm teaching uh, rhetoric and composition, because the sophists went around, say, 5th century, 4th century, 3rd century BCE Athens, um, primarily Athens, but some other, uh, other city-states as well. Anywhere where there was a democracy, the sophists could play an important role because essentially what the sophists did was they they understood rhetoric really well and they would teach people to do rhetoric they would teach people to make speeches in the uh, ecclesia the the assembly in athens in the agora um the sort of public public marketplace public sphere um and they would because democracy ran on an economy of making persuasive speeches and convincing other people to vote the way you wanted them to vote, if you could command rhetoric effectively, you could be incredibly powerful and influential. And the sophists realized this. And so they would go around and charge people to teach them rhetoric. So people would pay them in order to learn to, to be able to persuade others about any subject they wanted. And um, Protagoras, uh, one of the fragments of uh, from Protagoras is this phrase from Aristotle's rhetoric, and I think that's an important caveat, to make the weaker argument the stronger. So this was part of what the sophists promised was that you, if you took and applied their lessons, you could make a weak law case the winner. You could make a weak political position the winner because you would be able to persuade people whether or not what you were saying was true, right, just, etc., now, the reason I say it's probably an important caveat that this comes from Aristotle is because Aristotle was a student of Plato, who was a student of Socrates. And Socrates, according to Plato's dialogues, was not at all a fan of the Sophists. Aristotle was not a fan of the Sophists. Um, he sort of inherited that from his teachers. Um, and so I think there's there is potentially some dimension of misrepresentation of Protagoras and the the, uh, the sophists slightly in Aristotle's rhetoric. I think he he makes them seem somewhat more sinister and cynical than they probably were. But definitely they did give rhetoric lessons with the object being to convince people that, that once you learn rhetoric from them, you would be able to convince people of stuff, whatever stuff you wanted to convince them of. Some of the, some of the sophists were definitely less concerned with questions of truth and certainly, I would say, on the whole, they were less concerned with questions of truth than somebody like Socrates was. But considering Socrates sort of built his whole worldview around finding the truth, that's a sort of, that's a high bar to compare almost anybody to. So, 
uh, Protagoras, he's in this, he's in this school, um, and they, they do reflect a sort of limit to epistemology, a kind of relativism, even, or proto-relativism. Um, this idea that we can't know things for sure, necessarily, um, we can reason about them, but there are epistemological limits to what we can know. So, uh, for instance, one of the fragments, he says, Concerning the gods, I am unable to know either that they are or that they are not, or what their appearance is like. For many are the things that hinder knowledge, the obscurity of the matter and the shortness of human life. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> As a as a postmodernist who believes in the uh, the problem of epistemology, the limitations of what we can know for sure, yeah, I'm totally on board with that. But it's this very radical idea in a religious society, right? In a society in which The pre-Socratics are moving toward this idea of rationalism, this idea that the world should not be understood theologically, but should be understood what we would today call scientifically, right? It's a very radical idea in a society that is primarily built around theology, mythology, and supernatural explanations for the existence of the world to say yeah we don't we can't really know whether the gods exist i mean socrates was put to death supposedly for teaching atheism protagoras in this fragment is directly saying agnosticism is right. There are so many problems with how we accumulate knowledge that we can't actually know. We can't actually know the nature of the gods, the existence of the gods, even the truth of the gods, for sure. Again, this is a very radical thing, and it, it opens up these sort of questions about the nature of truth and the importance of truth, right? Because if if Protagoras is right here, and if we expand this principle out from the gods to we can't know anything for sure, Socrates' whole project comes crashing down, in a way, right? If we, if we simplify to the extreme what Socrates is all about, he is about finding the truth of something, finding the core essence, what is real about whatever subject, topic he's asking questions about. If that's impossible, if human knowledge is always too limited to find an objective, indisputable truth, that opens the way for the sophists. Because at that point, the question is not, what argument is true, the question is, what argument is more convincing? And again, for teachers of rhetoric, teachers who primarily are getting paid by people who want to learn to defend a position as opposed to uh, people who want to find out truth, that's, that's quite good for the sophists, right? If I can if I can get paid to teach you to make, so let's say you're, you're guilty of the crime you've been accused of, you have to go to the law courts and you have to defend yourself. If I can teach you for money to defend yourself, whether you're guilty or not, then I can make a living. Whereas if you're guilty... And I say to you, because you're guilty, you cannot prove that you're innocent. You're unlikely to pay me. 
So, I mean, I think this is a really important component of this. And and it's built on, again, this sort of relativistic idea, this idea that there are multiple perspectives on any given issue. And Protagoras brings this up in another fragment. Uh, he says, there are two opposing arguments concerning everything. Now, I actually think that's slightly wrong. Uh, I think there's typically multiple positions that can be taken on any issue. But within the structure of democratic Athens, the ecclesia, the agora, the, the, the courts, they tended to function on a binary system. Either X or Y. Either we take this policy or we take that policy. Is this person guilty or innocent? Whatever it is. And so in that ideological structure where everything is a binary choice, yeah, I mean, this is, and and this was sort of the root of the, the sophist's teaching approach often. It was uh, they, would, they would do exercises where you would have students create a speech arguing for one position and then create a speech arguing for the opposite position. And the expectation was that each of those speeches would be equally strong, equally persuasive. <laughs> that was the whole objective, right? It was to teach people to make compelling arguments rather than necessarily to make arguments that reflected truth. So again, if you, I, if you believe that there are epistemological limits to what we can know, then truth is not the central question. And if you are functioning in a society in which the ability to persuade others is political and social power, rhetoric becomes of paramount importance.